At the height of the Iran-Iraq war between 1983 and 1987, the highest echelons of the leadership of the Ba'ath Party of Iraq engaged in a comprehensive series of appraisals of the Shia seminary institution, the Hawza, and in the position of its leading figure, Grand Ayatollah Abu Qasim al khoi during the seminar held by the Center for Academic Shia Studies entitled The Ba'ath Party and the Hawza of Najaf, delivered by Professor Abbas Kalum at Imam Khoi Foundation. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the foundation, uh, the Al-Khoi Foundation, and uh, I am uh, honored to be able to chair this uh, evening's uh, discussion, which will be presented by Dr. Abbas Kalum on the relationship between the uh, Ba'ath Party uh, and the Hauser during one of its most uh, critical times uh, of modern history, the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, Dr. Abbas is uh, an assistant professor of Middle Eastern Studies at the Naval Postgraduate Institute uh, at Monterey, California. He's also a visiting scholar at Stanford University at the Hoover Institution, which, as you all know, is one of the uh, foremost uh, research centers uh, in the United States and in the world, probably. Uh, he's also the author of a well-received uh, book that has recently come out, uh, relating to the 1920 revolution in Iraq. Uh, he's a, he's a, a writer and a journalist also. His articles have been uh, noted in the uh, Alam newspaper in Baghdad. Uh, and his reputation as a rising uh, and eminent scholar of the uh, politics of the Middle East and especially of Iraq, uh, I think uh, we shall hear a great deal in the future about this uh, eminent scholar uh, of Iraqi uh, origin. Uh, just a short uh, uh, introduction on the archival basis of his research. Uh, as you all know, there's a major cache of documents that was retrieved uh, in Iraq immediately after the overthrow of the regime, uh, which found its way to uh, the United States and has been housed now at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And he's one of the first uh, focused researchers and scholars who has had access to these documents. So what you will uh, tell us this evening, I think, will be of not only of great importance, but it will also be new. Uh, and uh, this information will be extremely uh, important for uh, any true understanding of the relationship between the Hauser and the Majahir, uh, and the state. This issue has been going on for a long time, since the beginning of the modern state of Iraq. And uh, what we have now is an exposition of the most uh, dangerous period, I would say, in the history, of, in the modern history of the Hausa. With that, I'd like to pass the uh, mic to uh, Dr. Abbas Kahun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this generous introduction. Um, if there is anybody who is honored uh, at this table, that would be me to be introduced by such an eminent scholar of Iraq and also uh, someone uh, whose writings and uh, history of scholarship I have always admired and respected. So thank you very much for the honor. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the uh, time you are sparing here uh, to uh, listen to me, and uh, many thanks to the al Khoi Foundation, who has made um, not only my appearance here possible, but my coming to London. Last time I was here in London was uh, six years ago to do the research that uh, for my book that, that uh, Dr. Alaw just mentioned, and uh, my road took me almost to every part of the world except for London, so I don't know why, then uh, this uh, comes as a very treasured uh, opportunity for me to be here and to address you. Uh, please feel free to uh, comment uh, and I, one of the reasons why I'm here uh, because this is no f a final report. It is only the findings as the advertisement says of my work and uh, it is for the purpose of getting feedback, questions, concerns and corrections uh, as, as uh, you know the important and profound the title of scholar but a scholar is someone as I see it as someone who is in school to learn uh, 
rather than to, to teach. So I'm here to also learn from you uh, as much as I am going to convey some of what I found to you. So um, without a further introduction, again, many thanks to everybody in London. I've been generously met by friends and by uh, the uh, officials and uh, people in the uh, um, uh, foundation and out. And I must note also the heroic effort by my good friend and a great rising star in the Shia studies, uh, Haider al Khoui, who uh, is a wonderful uh, person to see uh, carrying the great legacy of Ayatollah al Khoui, uh, whom we all admire. So let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the project itself and then uh, continue uh, forward. Um, the project is uh, a simple uh, proposition, is to go and look at the more than 10 million documents that exist in this huge archive. And these 10 million documents, while the number is huge and scary sometimes for anyone who wants to endeavor researching such a huge archive, it is not all of the same importance. You know, sometimes you get 30 documents on the transfer of a policeman from Najaf to Anbar, and I don't know what that, that particular policeman was of interest to the Ba'ath Party to have all of these documents generated on moving him from Najaf to another place. Some are about citizens complaining, etc. Uh, I'm sure that these documents will be highly important for other researchers who study the structure of the state, the structure of the Ba'ath Party, how interstate relations were, uh, or intrastate relations, I should, were working, and you know, a lot of others. But for me, I don't see it as important as the uh, selection of documents that I picked to study initially. <clears throat> My project is six uh, pieces of research, or is, uh, consists of six pieces of, of research. One of them is what I'm going to talk about, which is uh, covering a span of time between 1983 and 1989. The other uh, project, I'm not going to speak about the others, just mention them. Another project dealt with the cleansing of the marshes in Iraq that was undertaken by um, then Adnan Khair al Fah being the uh, uh, Minister of Defense, and then it was, an effort was led by the Ba'ath Party, representing the Ba'ath Party was a, a high official named Abdul Ghani Abdul Ghafoor, you probably know uh, his name. Um, and that was last uh, an, a, a dossier that involved such things as ethnic uh, cleansing, religious cleansing, uh, simple poor cleansing sometimes also. Most of these people were wretched living of the, what the, the marsh offered them, fishing and eating a, uh, what, what they got out of the place, meager life. But they were uh, the focus of an onslaught from the regime that was unprecedented. Uh, and it is a, uh, a dossier that you can uh, see many uh, crimes against humanity being uh, committed, uh, wars, war crimes, etc. A third one dealt with <coughs> uh, Muhammad, Baqar, Muhammad Sadiq al Sadr's Friday prayer, and there is a big dossier with a lot of documents on the Friday prayers. Uh, the, the span was all the way until his assassination, and two days, in fact, after the, the assassination. <clears throat> and then one that is, I would say, a personal one, a number of friends of mine from the city of Kufa were uh, picked by the regime, and they discovered that they were part of a larger organization to undermine the Ba'ath Party in Najaf and maybe beyond. And I studied it, uh, part of being uh, faithful and loyal to uh, all time, time's sake uh, with, with friends with whom I went to middle school and high school and we studied in the nights under the same lamppost in Kufa. And you know, it's, it's personal, but also it came up as a wonderful case study on seeing how the regime handled these. Then the big issue of the uprising of 1991, and that's in itself, I don't know how to handle it whether to make it part of this series of studies or to have a book or a special project for it, because we deal with nine governorates at least, and a pile of uh, documents that we have to deal with. The uh, documents themselves are uh, classified uh, poorly, in fact, because it's very hard to find the documents. You have to spend hours and hours. Sometimes I would go to Stanford, sit from 8 in the morning until 4.45 when they close, 
and I don't find anything uh, that I can use or fit in any project. And sometimes I stumble on a dossier that gives me 200 documents about something I really want. So uh, it involved months of, and months, uh, and I'm like a fisherman sitting there throwing his uh, hook and waiting for something to come out. Uh, but Luckily, I've had a lot of success, and uh, some of it I just also I must thank the people at the Hoover Institution, especially the two Iraqis, Ahmed Dia and uh, Haider Hadi. And in fact, they were feeling sorry for me, so when they stumble on something, they tell me, Professor Calum, go and look here or there. There is some patch of documents in, in that place. So that also helped. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the documents themselves are typical Ba'ath Party documents. They can mean anything from reports written by hand from a low-level Ba'athist to uh, the follow-up on them from any level of the Ba'ath party, from the local party, the Furqa, if you will, uh, in, in the city, or the Shu'ba, which is the whole town headquarters, or the Far', which is the governorate level. And then it goes all the way to the organization, which we call it uh, the regional organization, Tanzim al-Furat, Tanzim al-Wasad, the South, the North, the Baghdad organization, or the South, uh, Central Iraq also, and there's the Euphrates. Uh, then there is also uh, uh, the, the next level, which will be taken to Amanat Sur al-Qatar, which is the Ba'ath Central Bureau, is what I call it in my, my terminology. Uh, from that, it goes either to Azat Ibrahim al Duri, Saddam's deputy, or to Saddam Hussein. Normally, comes back to them with handwritten uh, notes from Saddam Hussein himself, asking them to do things or asking questions. Then, beyond that, uh, it will uh, be forwarded to the relevant uh, government organizations, be it the Ministry of Information, be it the Ministry of Defense. Uh, mostly, all of them go to the uh, General Directorate of Security uh, to, to follow up on it, al amn al-Am, and so on. In the case of Kufa, as I mentioned to you, the, the organization, it was mostly handled by the uh, Military Intelligence Directorate, al-Mudiriyat uh, al-Istikhbarat al that I discovered to, uh, it, it reported really to the secretary of the president, which is interesting, it's, he's their boss. So these kinds of, of documents, some of them are uh, uh, typed, mostly the old typewriters that I used in the Iraqi military, Adnan Asayeg knows about those in the old days. Uh, you have to deal with a letter that always is missing and you have to write it by hand. Uh, all of the old mechanical handwrite, uh, uh, typewriters, or some are written by hand and then stamped to make it official. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, signatures that you have to figure out whose signature is that and the chronology of the movement of the document from one desk to another and who handled it, who saw it, who read it, who followed up on it. So there is a lot of study of the documents that I'm doing <coughs> and also studying what I called the body language of the documents. It's not always the text in it that is important, but sometimes when Saddam underlines two words, or put, say, uh, an, a remark of two words on a document. And then all of a sudden, when it comes back from Saddam to his secretary, the report of 10 pages uh, will get uh, dissected and uh, literally disassembled, and it will be uh, sent in different uh, memoranda that will go from one uh, place to another and then see what the follow-up. One beautiful thing about the Ba'ath Party, and I, don't, I can't believe I say something beautiful about the Ba'ath Party, is that they documented everything. And they, they even attached the handwritten memo that is written to the typewriter uh, operator to say type this. So they put the handwritten and then the typed one and everything is attached and every book or, or memoranda mentioned. So as an academic, I love it. It's just a feast because we always complain about lack of documents. Here I'm dealing with the abundance of documents. So that's important. Why are these documents important? Some of them don't tell me anything that we didn't know. We always suspected that Saddam Hussein would study the Hausa and would follow it and would order people to see what everything, search, surveillance, etc. It's well known. What we don't know first uh, is that uh, exactly what was done. And these documents tell us exactly what was done. What we don't know was, uh, or, or we don't know for sure in a documented way who was involved. These documents tell us exactly who was involved. 
What we don't know is that when something started and when it ended and what the process was. These documents tell us exactly what this uh, process is. There, we sometimes do have speculations or events, uh, unclassified things. Here I'm talking about documents that were not made to be seen by any human being or, or, or any other form of living except for the people who are involved in them. And they are very candid when uh, Azzat Ibrahim talks to Saddam Hussein, or Father Al Barrak talks to, to Azzat Ibrahim. These are people who are exactly candid in reporting things because they are not worried that these documents will be given to the Iraqi people, etc. It's all internal. So they are very important in that case, and I am uh, thrilled to, to go through them. Uh, of course, when you go in through any number of documents, there is a chill sent down your spine when you read some of these, because I can't tell where I was when this thing was going on, and I can't tell exactly how this process. Prob the other thing is that I, who lived 24 years in Iraq, 22 of them were under the Ba'ath regime, thought I knew the Ba'ath, I discovered that I didn't know the first thing about the Ba'ath Party until I saw these documents. So they are that important. They are confirming a lot of things. They are refuting a lot of things. I would dare say here, even though I am at this stage, this stage of the research, is that these documents will have to force us to revisit the narrative of Iraqi history on many issues, the evaluations of personalities, the description of events, and all of that that has been made in the past. We have to, uh, ethically at least, if not academically, etc., to revisit what we have written in the past or what we have said or what has been written, no matter who the scholar was. And that's not to undermine what has been written. It's all great scholarship. It's just because a lot of it was written without the benefit of looking at these documents before. So, so I'm really uh, commending what has been written and the work, uh, but definitely we have to go back and, and face it with all of the candidness and all of the, uh, the, the courage to do it. The questions that I am, uh, uh, so, so here I was saying that there, is, there are the documents and what they dictate and there is the literature that we have and we have to reconcile one with another. That we also have to provide context for these documents. I don't say that I have every document about everything and that's very important as well. Uh, the questions that I have in this particular research is that uh, when was al Khui really quietest? Uh, this idea, while al khui did not invent quietism in Iraq as being described, uh, there were many before him who took the same, it was associated with him. Uh, when now, a lot of people, when they speak about Grand Ayatollah al khui uh, they also put uh, quietism uh, next to his name, or when they speak about quietism, so much so that some people began to say it's a school that was made, or it is the school of al khui versus the school of Iran. Uh, the question here, do these documents support or refute this kind of, of documentation, of, of uh, argument? Another one was um, attached to it or taken from it is that, was al khui really accommodating of the, of the regime? Did he accommodate the regime? Did he go along? Did he, or was he a resistant uh, person in, in one way or the other? And this is very important because that there is also a conventional wisdom that I found to be smacking in the, uh, against these documents. Uh, the other one was, uh, you know, although probably a sensitive issue. Was the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein and his entourage waging a war on the Shia? in these documents and in these events and the, uh, associated with them? Or was it in a different context, uh, a context, sorry, of, of the, uh, an even contest as well, uh, between the Iranian or pro-Iranian loyalty versus the pro-Iraqi loyalty, Persian versus Arab? Uh, this, uh, that comes a lot in the parlance of the Ba'ath Party and in the documents. Sometimes the use of, of Persian and, and Iranian and Shia, they come interchangeably. And the question is, why is that? So is it anti-Shia or is it anti-Persian per se? Because I find places where Azat Ibrahim and others, they are talking about the possibility of inventing a, an Iraqi Ja'fari Madhab. What does that mean? And, and you know, how do you do that? And what are the steps? And they talk about those. So they are very important to me. So these are the questions. The documents themselves uh, ask 
serious questions. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the culmination of the whole process of, of the documents and the events that were uh, being uh, uh, sort of uh, what, what the end result was are the following questions. This is the task for the high cadre of the Ba'ath Party that evaluated the Hausa, looked at the studies and the documents, and was to recommend a decision to Saddam Hussein. And these are everybody who was under Saddam Hussein, basically. I mean, there is nobody above them that was left wasn't involved in that final committee. And these questions were, should al Khu stay in Iraq or should he leave? And if so, why? You know, should stay, why, leave, why? The other one was, could an Arab replacement of al Khu be found? So we can have an Iraqi Hausa with an Arab replacement for al Khu, Or is it going to be doomed always to have someone in their parlance and in their, uh, you know, they deem as Persian or Iranian? And they clear about what it means to be an Iranian. You could be a Sayyid from Muhammad's descendants. They say, if you live with your family and your ancestors in Iran, you became a Persian. It doesn't matter. And that's why, as I said, it's, it's, they use a lot of these terms loosely in, in that sense. And the final question was, uh, can religious schools be co-opted? You know, there are the religious schools that taught the Hausa students, uh, you know, the Madrasat al khui and all of the other schools that taught uh, and, and manufactured, if you will, Hajjat uh, al-Islam and Ayatollahs and Grand Ayatollahs. Could they be nationalized in a way, the way Nasser did to Al-Azhar or any other form, uh, co-opt it, put it, make it part of the, or you had to ultimately buy the bullet and then close them and risk a, comfort, a confrontation with the Shia. That's the kind of uh, another question that we had to, to see and, and we had to look at. And then the documents talk a lot about these things extensively. Uh, and, and here is what I would do. So let me give you an outline of the whole thing. The whole deal started with something that had nothing to do with al khui nothing with the schools, nothing with the, none of that. The whole thing started with a, uh, a problem the regime had with the Ashura visit to Imam al-Hussein, the commemoration, and then the Arba'een and the walk. With Ashur, of course, the Rakhda Tatwarij, this marathon that we use, uh, named after Tatwarij. People will participate in it. My father almost participated in each one of those, and uh, all of the others. <coughs> then uh, the task was made uh, or, or given to Ali Hassan al-Majid. I mean, you love it when they want to deal with something of importance. That's what you pick. So they told him, take whomever you want, study these issues. How, can, how could it be that even we banned it in the 70s and we are taking people and putting them in jail and executing them, and still it's happening? So uh, the year before that, we had 450,000 people participating in it. I know it's a ridiculous number concerning with you know, the nine uh, million people that are reported, but 450,000 defying the regime at the time in Iraq, that's nothing short of a miracle. Okay, so, so that's what, what you really uh, deal with. Uh, and the question here is, take a look at it. Why is this happening? Why are women still taking their little kids every year to, to, the, to the Ziyara? And these kids will grow up in this environment and they will become like their mothers and their fathers and they talk about this. So Ali Hassan Majid takes the task at, uh, uh, to heart and then goes on to study it. Uh, the whole deal began, his, he was designated on 15th October 1983, just to give you an idea when these documents begin to emerge. He takes about a year, uh, all the way or less, uh, 20th of August, he completes his work. We don't have much other than just basically our documents contacting his committee members, telling them we will meet this time, we will meet that time. Important in that was uh, basically a, a task to Mizban Khadr Hadi, who was, uh, and, and uh, that year was Abdel Hassan Rahil Faran and Mizban Khadr Hadi, they took turns in being the head of the Euphrates organization where Najaf and Karbala was, and they asked them to prepare a study about the Hausa. And these guys, of course, you know, the type of a person who will do this, so they turned to those who knew, mostly people they know in Najaf, uh, fiqh, Kuliyat uh, al-Fiqh guys, uh, scholars in Najaf, etc. So to be honest with you, I loved the study they prepared. It's a great study about the Hawza. Talks about it from the days of the Imams to the days of Tawsi to uh, uh, throughout the times until it reaches Al-Khu'i and it gives you wonderful information, numbers, figures, statistics, etc. 
then they give it, uh, and also a lot of issues regarding the finances of the Hausa, numbers of the students, the schools and where they are located, the breakdown of the students, Iraqis and foreigners and this and that. Everything that you need to know about the Hausa was given to them uh, up to that point. Uh, highly updated uh, document. They give the report all the way to Saddam Hussein on 20th August 1984. So from October 83 to August 84, less than a year, that report is being unified, sent to uh, uh, Saddam. What is the report? Uh, it is basically talking about uh, or uh, three zones in the report or three segments. One of them, the positive things that they list. What was positive they found uh, from studying the Ashura and Muharram uh, and, and Arba'in? Then the negative issues and their recommendations. About a 43 uh, page document. Uh, among the positive things like, for example, the numbers are less this year, uh, you know, almost half uh, in, in the Muharram, yet the Arba'in had more. Why? Because it coincided with Friday and people were not working, so they went, uh, for example. Uh, another uh, issue, they talked about uh, positive events that there is not much of incidents that is going, uh, that, that happened or took place no confrontations, no chants no, against the regime. Anything that they found to be less threatening, they listed as positive. Mainly, the smaller number was considered an achievement of the Ba'ath Party activities that dissuaded people from going. The, um, uh, the negative boiled down all to al Khoui and his activities. It's just they found everything is wonderful in Iraq, except for that one al Khoui, who is sitting there giving us all kinds of troubles. How he's troublesome? Uh, first, uh, you know, they list a laundry list of, of kinds of things that al Khoui did that they didn't like. Uh, some of them had nothing to do with even the subject. He spoke to his sons in, in Persian. So there is disloyalty to Iraq. You are sitting in Iraq and you have to do it. He uh, was, for example, uh, 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 giving a lot of preference and deference to the non-Iraqis, especially Iranians and Afghanis and etc. Pakistanis, things like that. But the meat of it, or the most important parts of that, that could be considered Khoui activities, were his personal participation in this. And they say, well, we have, he's the only marja who does it. He's the only high religious figure who goes there and participates with his sons and with his deputies, representatives, Wukala, and then entourage, and they go there. And we are trying to tell the Shia that this is an Islamic practice, this is bad practice, this is wrong, you guys are doing superstitious things. And then they see al Khoui participating in, so it is, must be the core of Shiism and the core of Islam. And as long as al Khoui keeps doing it, all our message goes through the window. That's, that's a substantial thing, more than speaking in Persian to his sons, uh, for example. Uh, other things is that he was distributing money, not just attending. He gave money, about uh, 15,000 dinars at the time. Remember, this is 1980s. Dinar was uh, $3.75 dollars. I don't know how much in pound. But clearly, a lot of money that he distributes uh, among those who will prepare food, etc. His sons participate in all of the rituals, and they took pictures of the food and the service and all of that for what, uh, etc. So there is a lot of this uh, stuff that, that was going on. Uh, Saddam looks at it and then makes uh, some of those uh, uh, remarks on it and then sends it back. Uh, on, uh, and, and as I said, the, thought, the last part is what is important, as list of recommendations uh, replacing Arabic with, uh, with uh, Persian with Arabic in the teaching, uh, several other issues, uh, uh, you know, state does things, uh, the Ba'ath Party does something, the security apparatus does something. But the secretary of Saddam for party affairs takes the liberty of making five specific recommendations to Saddam Hussein. One of them was replacing the Arabic, uh, the, the Persian with Arabic in all of the Hausa levels of teaching, activities, etc. One of them was uh, to make sure that the curricula is being checked and then all of the things that are not approved, especially written in Persian, destroyed books, etc. That's when we started seeing waves of, of raid on libraries, private collections to destroy any books that were considered uh, banned. Uh, another one which is highly important, and that became the meat of what was to come. Again, that was supposed to be the end of the effort, 19, uh, August of 1984. 
The secretary said, I recommend that you have a higher profile committee to study al khuis conduct and see about on his sons and his deputies and then see uh, or find ways to uh, contain these then. دراسة تصرفات الخوئي وتحجيمها. Okay, لدراسة تصرفات الخوئي وتحجيمها. That is very important because then Saddam writes with his handwriting, I agree. And then from that point on, the new phase started, which is what I'm uh, interested in even more because it's all about Khoui now. Uh, the, uh, the, the committee was formed almost immediately. Um, and then uh, began to, uh, to look at uh, the, the task that was there. Uh, a couple of things in the report that, was, that were taken without further uh, things that I, worth, uh, I think worth mentioning. Remember, it came on 20th August. 30 August uh, uh, was the approval. 27 October, the, the, the uh, Revolutionary Command Council issues a directive to deport all foreign students uh, who finished their studies at Al Hausa or who came to the country without proper approvals to study. Everybody should leave. They also instructed every single agency in the government to tell their foreign uh, workers not to participate in Muharram and Arba'in and all of the other rituals. It was completely banned on anyone who would do it, especially the Indians and Pakistanis and, and others. And these are everybody, even those who worked in the uh, uh, energy uh, plants and those who worked you know, the, the, the atomic energy, etc. Everybody got the memo, if you will. <clears throat> then uh, on the uh, on the 23rd of September they, that came to the Ba'ath party organizations here the secretary will send it to the central bureau Aman Sur al Qatar and these guys sent to the to the south to the uh, central to the north to Baghdad and to Euphrates uh, with the same uh, memo study al khui and his sons and his uh, representatives all their activities and give us recommendations of how to contain them uh, those guys take this job and then they report back with full studies uh, from uh, 25 October. The first to do it was Abdul Ghani Abdul Ghafoor. If you were to think about one who was more than Saddam Hussein in his enthusiasm to do harm to, to Iraqis, I would pick Abdul Ghani Abdul Ghafoor as my, my uh, in all of the things. I found him on like 20, 30 issues. Each one of them, he's the foremost and he's the most. He was the Hajjaj fuel of Saddam's uh, deal. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, he, he sent his in, on 25th October, while the last one sent it on 22 de December. Now, the Ba'ath Party, you know, you talk about almost two months. That's blasphemy uh, for the guy who sent it on 22nd December. Uh, ironically, a guy I thought he would send it earlier, the 22nd December, came from Samir al-Sheikhli from Baghdad. And this guy was very enthusiastic uh, also. Uh, 25th October to 26th October. 12th December, Azat Ibrahim gets the memo that you will chair the committee to study all of this uh, information that we gave. Now, what was sent by the South, the Euphrates, etc., was a memo with a little study. Some of it were long, some of them were short, mainly talking about what was going on in activities in their jurisdiction, in the provinces that they, they had, uh, about al Khoui or his representatives or his sons, the visits, etc. But more importantly, I think, from that patch of documents, I found the classification of al Khoui's representatives between two kinds of lists, those who were against the regime, hating the regime, al haqidun uh, and those who were cooperative with the regime. And I know each one of you wants to jump at me and catch me from here, so that give me the names. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but the reason also we have to put it in perspective, in fact, uh, when you talk about cooperative, don't let your mind go to people who are writing reports or spying on, on Shia, et cetera. None of that was. And, and the documents are there for, to check my word. A cooperative was a guy who basically uh, went, a representative of Ayatollah al khui in Basra, for example, who would go and attend a funeral for an officer in the, in the Iraqi military who died in the Iraq-Iran war. 
that's kind of listed as cooperation. Uh, those who are haqidin, those who are kind of against the regime, you talk about the ones who had a daughter uh, married to someone who was in the da'wah party or was deserting the military or was executed for a certain deal. If he himself did not uh, mention uh, or, or cooperate with the regime, almost none of them agreed to attack Ayatollah Khomeini except for two or three that are mentioned. So even if I give you the names of those who are cooperative, it's not really much of stuff to go and tell someone, shame on you, none of that. Given the circumstances, I think these people were honorable uh, at all cases uh, in, in that sense. But the list was very impressive of those who denied the regime any satisfaction uh, of, of uh, uh, this. And again, these are there to, for anybody to check. I'm not, gonna, I'm not the gatekeeper for them, but I'm the only one probably who saw them so far, so take my word for it. Uh, the uh, Azat Ibrahim takes charge. Uh, forms a committee that included everybody almost who was important in the, in the uh, regime at the time in the Ba'ath Party. Sa'dun Hamadi, Sa'dun Shakir, Mizban Khadr Hadi, Abdul Hassan Rahi Faraon, Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi, Fadl al Barak. I mean, the whole list of, of uh, people, Fawzi Khalaf al the uh, uh, yeah, basically uh, all of that, that, that entourage that was around Saddam Hussein. And Azat Ibrahim was the chair in that. Uh, someone like Saad al Hamadi, I would, I would uh, like to, to mention to you. He was a, fly, a flower on the wall. He didn't do much. All what he said and all of that was, I think, one statement that is less than a line. And he was just there to show Saddam I was in the meeting. But he didn't really participate. Uh, again, the enthusiasm ranges from highest would be Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi, then Abdul Hassan Rahel Faraon, then Saadun Shakir was venomous, but Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi was, was really bad. And remember, very important note here on the side, is that most of them were considered from, you know, drawn from the Shia community, Muhammad Hamza Zubaydi, etc. So we are not talking about you know, sinister Sunni Tikritis sitting there and for, behind the party. No, it is the, most of them, except for Azat Ibrahim and a couple others, everybody else was a Shia. So that's very important also to put as a side note to what, what was going on. Uh, and, and that's uh, simply. Then they get to meet. I have the, uh, the documents that are the minutes of their meeting, the Mahvar al Ishtama, which is very important in, in that uh, sense. Uh, meanwhile, um, I would uh, show that uh, when, when they, they um, get this, uh, there is already a, um, uh, a hostility that was uh, created uh, already uh, in, uh, against uh, Saddam Hussein. They were given studies, and the studies basically were uh, telling them a lot about al khui his representatives, etc. There was also a memo that was sent to Saddam that is interesting about the family of al khui They list Jamal al khui for example, who died in the same year, uh, according to the documents. I, I don't, don't know, say Jamal, to be honest, uh, and, and his life, but they mention him as someone who fled from Iraq and who was in Syria, and he died and was buried in, in, in Iran as one of the people, the, the cause that al khu is against the regime. Jamal was against the regime, Harab, he, he, he fled. His son, Jamal's son, who was uh, listed as a da'wah party member, who fled to Iraq, and then there, he was in Iran, according to that, at the time, an engineer. Again, I don't know Musa, uh, the son of Jamal al khu so uh, that's the name I might be. You know, I'm just telling you what's in the documents. All of the, them are against the regime. Uh, then there is uh, Taqi and Majid, Sayyid Majid al and Sayyid Taqi al of course, and we all know they both uh, tragically were, were uh, uh, targeted by the regime. Uh, one of them was by the regime, and, and then the other died uh, tragically also after the, uh, the, the uh, invasion. Uh, uh, and uh, they were listed both as uh, against the regime, and they were active in what was called the Republican Islamic Party. Uh, then uh, with them was, were two people from the entourage of Sayyid Khoui, Fakhri Yaqub and Ahmed al -Kadhami. These are things that were telling them, okay, these are people also you have to see and look at. Um, and then of course, alongside the deputies of al Khoui in all of the parts of, of Iraq. Uh, in June 87, this, uh, Azat Ibrahim does not start with a fresh uh, kind of uh, um, uh, study. He just resurrects the studies that were sent from 84 and 85. So two years later, after the 85 study, he sends it to all of the committee members, said, study them, look at whatever you know on your notes, and then we will come and discuss one, in one final meeting 
the fate of the Hausa, the fate of Hui and all of that. He, I will talk about it in a second. Uh, again, the names I mentioned already were already in the meeting and, and uh, uh, that's how, you know, breakdown of their general overview of this issue. Abdul Hassan Rahil Faraon was the first to speak, and we all know who he is. Uh, he was he was from uh, the, the the Middle Euphrates. Uh, you know, his family has a long record between revolutionaries and and others, tribal leaders. Uh, he was uh, against this idea that the uh, Ba'ath Party uh, establishes a new school and then co-opting them. Uh, he said, well, we are going to proliferate the problem instead of uh, you know, fixing it. So, so he was thinking we should really not uh, increase the presence of the Hausa rather than uh, decrease it. Um, however, Azat Ibrahim was the kind of the person who said this is what we should do. He said we don't have to make it so overt. We have to identify an ayatollah, and we don't even tell him. And we go and find non-Ba'athists, and we give them the money, and send them to him and say, this money is zakat and khumis from me and my tribe. And then anybody whom we see very nice or mild, this way we get that person instead of someone we don't know. So we empower them. And the moment we empower them, we find access to them. That was, again, then. Fadl al-Barraq, who was the brain in the room, uh, he has a PhD. He was the head of the, uh, or had a PhD. He was the um, uh, general, or the director of general security uh, at the time in, in Iraq. He said, this is not going to work. Uh, what I suggest is that you leave the Hausa alone. And this is something that would have to be mentioned, because that's where the only one was Father Lil Barak. Not to say he's nice, I mean, he was nasty. But he had his own ways that I'm going to tell you about. He said, we squeeze to the Hausa to a point where there is no more room to squeeze them. That's it. It's gone. If you do anything more, the Hausa will jump to Iran. Because all we have left is al khui and 200, 300 students. Most of them were foreigners. You start deporting people, and then al khui will leave. You will not have al Hausa. And remember, this is in the middle of the Iraq-Iran war. So lo losing the Hausa, a lot of issues that can come as ramifications, and that's very important important for this. Uh, looks like, wow, I'm impressed with myself, keeping almost on time. So Father Al-Barrak was of, of that interest. He said also, forget al khui in terms of trying to co-opt him, make him do anything. I was with him one of those days, and I was speaking to him, trying to convince him to be on our side, and he was laughing. And I said, why, Mawlana, are you laughing? He said, you Ba'thi young youth don't understand. I only have a few years left. Do you want me to uh, finish or to, to, to set explosives to my own madhab in the last days of my life? I'm not going to do it. In other words, he was telling him, you want to kill me, kill me. Uh, there is not much left. But I'm not going to do it. There's no way you can make me do it. Azat Ibrahim said, you are in good company. I went to him, and I said, and that's Azat speaking. He said, I told him, I want you to give your honest opinion about uh, Khomeini. Well, you know, we know that. Ayatollah Khomeini had a lot of disagreements intellectually with Ayatollah Khomeini. So just give us your honest opinion. Don't lie, don't force, don't do anything against your convictions. And Sayyid Khomeini said, looked at me and said, yeah, I will do it, but I will also in the same breath have to evaluate Iraq. I can't just talk about Khomeini, I will give my opinion in you, too. And Khazad said, no, thanks. <laughs> we don't want that. And he said that the last time I, I had, you know, I, I was having any hopes in him. So that's another thing, a, a clever way of saying, well, look, and I'm going to do it. But why didn't he do it? I mean, he was not going to lie. He was not going to say anything. Uh, Ayatollah Khoui was not interested even in saying the truth, okay, if it meant that it will be taken, tampered with, doctored, and then shown to the Iraqi people that Sayyid al Khoui was in support of the regime. Okay, and, and that's the only time they managed to do it was after 1991. And they asked him a sly question. Is it, pass, is it allowed for the, for the Muslims to uh, steal property and, and to uh, burn and loot? And of course, he said no. So that, and then they took it and they said, al Khoui condemned the 1992. So he knew that way before it really happened. But 91 was a different context. All of the masks went down. Everything else was completely uh, a different uh, context, and, and that's why. Uh, so finally, uh, what we have here is that, um, in, in essence, 
the final conclusion, they said, we have to leave al Khoui. And I'm going to, by the way, please ask questions, because we have plenty of time I'm going to leave, uh, to get things about these that I am, have no time to mention, so I want to use them during the Q&A. Uh, the idea here is that uh, when they sent the final uh, report to uh, their verdict on the Hausa to Saddam Hussein, uh, their recommendations were really, or, or uh, conclusions were three. One, keep al khoui in Iraq. Why? They said because if al khoui leaves Iraq, the Hausa will leave too. And this is an interesting point for someone like me who studied the Hausa. Remember, the Hausa used to be like that. The Hausa would follow the Alim, you know, when the Al Imam Sadiq was in Alayhi Salam was in Kufa or in Medina, it was after him. When someone is even the Qummis took it to Qum, when Al Mufid came, it went to Baghdad in the second, last part of the twen, uh, fourth century AD, tenth century. Uh, it stayed in Baghdad with Al Murtada, the residence, and then Sheikh Al Taif. Sheikh Al Taif leaves Baghdad, it goes to Najaf after him. Since Sheikh Al Taif, almost a thousand years. The school of Najaf did not feel threatened or was not threatened by the death or life of an alim or the residence of an alim, even if someone more qualified resides elsewhere, when it happened, you know, Ali uh, in Samarra, the uh, Shirazi uh, in uh, Karbala with Ha'iri and many other cases, uh, Baghdad at a time with Al Khalasi, etc. Najaf continued to be a Hausa. Who, since Sheikh Al Ta'ifa, was the only time when he was the Hausa. You take him out, the Hausa will leave. And that is very, very important, and indeed the reason why we still have Hausa in Najaf. Uh, because it was the status of Khoui, and also no one was left other than Khoui to keep that. And that's why, you know, I told Haider the other day, I'm willing to coin the phrase that Al Khoui would be Sheikh Al Ta'if Al Thani. No one ever said it, and I think he deserves that. He deserves it scholarly because he, no one has profound in our times scholarship like that. And he deserves it in the sense that he became the Hausa. And I believe that the pressures that were on him and the resistance he had done and the achievements and management where he took all of these hostile circumstances and produced a Hausa that stayed and that persisted in Najaf. And then it was a foundation for the boom after 2003. We didn't have to import anybody when 2003 happened. It was the homegrown Najaf Hausa that came from the woodwork and gave us the blessing, you know, the, the fabulous kind of state right now. How could that, that's, I think, the work of someone like Al Khoui. And again, this is the last thing I'm gonna say nice out of the academic slant about Khoui because I think he deserves it. So that's very important. Everything I've been trying to back by documents. And I believe this is easy argument to, to make and make it stick. The second part that was done was to focus on, from now on on the Arab-Persian conflict. Make the TV from you know, day and night, show drama series, everything else, programs, etc. Show Saddam Hussein's visits to, to the, 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 the Atabat, everything, and make sure that every drama series that comes, Arab on Iraqi that's being produced, it has to focus on that main theme. The Persians are against the Arabs, against Islam, they are the fake Islam, and we are the right Islam, and all of that to bombard the people with this. And the third and final conclusion was to the reduction of the schools in Najaf and Karbala. This is a task that is not new. It began way before that. Saddam Hussein, on March 85, he made a 110 comments saying, close all of the schools that had less than 50 students. In other words, keep only two schools, because all of the schools. As part of this, or as a result of that policy, we had no school in Karbala left at all, zero. There were two students that were only taught by Sayyid al khuis representatives in 1985. And there, was, there were only a couple of schools left in that that had 62 students from Iraq and then about 300 so students from uh, other origins. Uh, so it was done. And Najaf had only two schools. So basically left with Al Khoui's school and, and one other. And that, again, was considered as an achievement of the regime. So it was started earlier. I am going to stop here. I was asked to say a couple of things in Arabic with the permission of uh, Dr. Alawi, and then we will open it. And looks like I'm slightly over time by a minute or two, so I'm not bad. Oh, 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 oh.